Welcome to the Potter Blog site. It's Tuesday, September 20th, 2011. This is an update on our detection of long half-life fallout here in St. Louis on September the 14th. Uh, the short of the video is, is that we have detected long half-life fallout here in St. Louis. Uh, by long half-life, I basically mean approximately 24-hour half-life uh, for the given detection levels using the Geiger counter. That's a pretty long half-life to detect. The indications are from the half-life data that uh, the fallout is uh, Neptunian 239 and given those indications uh, the long-term prognosis for Fukushima putting out this type of fallout every time there's a criticality event would indicate that uh, the explosive dispersion of the quorum is, might be an effective risk mitigation strategy. So that's the summary of the video. I'll go into some more detail in the detection and hopefully give you a better understanding. I would advise going to the uh, Potter Blog website uh, where I'll have some further links that uh, back up the data on this uh, detection and give you some further insight into the, to the extremely high detections we've been making of uh, short half-life uh, fallout since August 20th and now this longer half-life fallout. And given that we that the data indicates the half-life data indicates that this fallout is actually Neptunium-239 which uh, converts to Plutonium-239 uh, in a few days. Give you a uh, a jet stream map here. This is not a simulation, this is the actual jet stream. Uh, shows from September 9th, 2011th through uh, September 16th and this will give you an idea of where this fallout of this uh, longer half-life uh, fallout came down. So I'll play the video here and keep an eye on this jet stream and what you will see is that the majority of this fallout would have fallen in Canada and then right here towards uh, September 14th, you'll see the jet stream dip down here into the Midwest and then it'll cross over into uh, the Yankee states, basically New England. So you can see here in St. Louis we basically got a glancing blow out of this and this would have been September 15th so let's go back one day. So in essence, this is the glancing blow we got here in St. Louis. And you can see there's still sun coming in, uh, these gray areas of the jet stream. Uh, so the fallout would have been, as we showed earlier, across Canada, dipping down the Midwest, and then up into the uh, Yankee states. So let's keep going. You can see how it crosses off into New England. So these are all areas where the primary fault, this longer half-life fallout that we believe uh, was Neptunium-239. Uh, areas where it would be wise to look for it and expect for it to be. A little information on uh, Neptunium-239 has a half-life of uh, 2.3 days. It comes from either Uranium-239 which has a half-life of uh, 23 minutes. So if Uranium-239 were the source that would mean that uh, all this uh, neptunium is coming directly from Fukushima in the form of neptunium and it's not unheard of for uh, fallout with the half lives of uh, less than four days to be uh, intercontinentally transported. Uh, the other route to make a neptunium is americium-243 and that's by far the uh, scarier alternative because it's got a 7,000 year half-life and it's an alpha emitter and the de primary decay product from Neptunium-239 is a uh, Plutonium-239 alpha, em alpha emitter again with a uh, 24,000 year half-life. So let's go to the actual detection itself and I'll give you a breakdown of the uh, detection signature of uh, what we detected. 
Now here's our chart. Uh, you notice it runs over 120 hours. Uh, total counts per hour. This is based on, actually we had to do these uh, counts. So there's two, uh, two uh, basically modes here. Uh, these, the short half-life section, this was all uh, detected using uh, standard methods, just reading off the Geiger counter over time. As we go down into here, we're closer to uh, background radiation. And to uh, get an accurate reading on this, what I had to do was take a uh, one hour count. So I'd take a one hour total count of the sample, and then I'd take a one hour total count of the background radiation, subtract off the two, and then you have the uh, total count coming from uh, the sample. And one has to do that in this lower regime here because the uh, signal to noise ratio is not as, as not as good when the detection rates are higher. So to overcome the signal to noise ratio we have to uh, integrate over a longer time period. And basically what we have here, if you look at this chart, is we have the high, uh, high levels of uh, what turned out to be radon, radon daughters actually. And these levels are so high that if a pregnant woman were out in this ring for any period of time, uh, uh, government regulations would indicate that the, a pregnant woman should avoid this rainfall. That's how high this is. Uh, I believe that these high radon levels, this is only the second time we've actually detected radon here in St. Louis in, these radon, in, these, uh, in this rainfall. I believe these uh, readings are so high because uh, in essence what's happening is we've had a limited, a limited meltdown in uh, Fukushima and the quariums contacted groundwater uh, groundwater in Japan, especially after an earthquake or during earthquake activity, is heavily loaded with radon. And there have been reports of uh, steaming vents coming out of the ground in Fukushima. So, thorium in contact with groundwater would, would create a uh, limited criticality, which would carry uh, heavily radon laden water into steam, which we would detect over here. Uh, transcontinental detections of uh, radon are not unheard of. Then the next level, which is uh, new, which we have never detected before here in St. Louis, is uh, longer half-life radiation. Usually this goes back down to uh, background levels. Here it's held up beyond background levels. And for this uh, roughly two-day period in here, two-and-a-half-day period almost, uh, we were getting read on, uh, readings that indicated uh, decay times of uh, that matched uh, Neptunium-239. Uh, what's interesting is, as we get out here to this 92-hour period, uh, there's a spike in radioactivity. And this is to be expected in a uh, radon detection. Uh, radon has a half-life of 92 hours. Uh, this sample is in a, a plastic bag, so the alpha radiation is blocked. So right around 92 hours is when we would expect uh, our maximum potential to detect uh, radon daughters again from the radon that was trapped in the water in our sample in the Ziploc bag uh, converting to radon daughters. So we actually have a spike here that in uh, radioactivity that exactly matches what we would expect for radon. So we've got a, a, a double match for radon, one based on the, this curve and the other based on the detection uh, 92 hours afterwards. So let's first talk about this, give you a quick look at the short half-life detection. Uh, the red line is the actual detection. Uh, the black line is an exponential curve fit from which we uh, calculate the uh, half-life, uh, the estimated half-life here. And this is a composite half-life because there's actually two products in here, two decay products. The composite half-life is 36.5 minutes and that's pretty much exactly what we would expect from right on. So let's look over here at the uh, longer half-life part of it. And so basically what we've done here is uh, blown up this highlighted section of the curve. And again, right at the 92 hour point, we have our peaks from radon. And if you map this out here, you subtract this. Actually, we first expect, suspected we had Neptunium-239 based on uh, the, the decays of these readings in here. And so that's why we ran it out to 120 hours. So if we remove the, uh, the radon component at 92 hours into this, and basically what I've done here is uh, 
put two curves on here, two exponentials. One from the start point to the end point, which gives us uh, comes up to a 2.22 day half-life, and one where I map the whole curve. And when you map the whole curve, we get a approximately a 1.9 day half-life. Now there is some variability in here because of uh, uh, the methodology of taking one hour readings and then taking one hour readings of background and some potential some weather changes but uh, I would expect uh, variation here and here to be plus or minus uh, 25 counts per minute uh, worst case scenario would be uh, plus or minus uh, 100 counts per minute and that's real that's almost a four sigma scenario but uh, Weather changes do happen in here, so there's a little bit of variability, which is why I bounded the equation. And what you see here is we basically have a, uh, a signature of Neptunium-239 in our decay here in St. Louis. Now, that by no means means that it's a lock that this is Neptunium-239, but it's strongly indicative. Yeah, it's indicative enough that if we were doing an R&D research project, that uh, this would be enough to... Uh, to allocate more budget to research this further. Now, the risk out of this, out of this whole mess, is this decay product from Neptunium 239 and its parent, Americium, their long half life and they're potentially very unpleasant to have in your fallout. So, if we look here again at the uh, the fallout map and the gray areas being the jet stream and I'll restart this where you can again see where the fallout likely would have been here from this you know the risk is is now we have a, a MOX fuel facility unit 3 in Japan that's uh, on again off again criticality in groundwater and it appears every time it's going critical it uh, has been creating uh, massive amounts of Neptunium-239 and there have been two independent reports of that uh, fortunately for the XSKF site here they translate data for us and we have at least two detections occurring in August rep reported from two different places although they attribute these detections to uranium instead of americium <clears throat> uranium I guess would be the preferable uh, route because that means eventually we get out of this dangerous 239 it's immediately dangerous at the levels in Japan because of uh, short half-life means it has higher radioactivity uh, it's long-term dangerous in uh, plutonium because uh, plutonium is some nasty stuff how nasty depends on who you want to listen to so the question comes down to it's not just the fact that we've now got potentially neptunium and plutonium and americium uh, falling down on us here in the United States. So we basically have a factory producing this now in Japan. I mean, that's in essence what's going on. We have a long-term pump that uh, is going to produce neptunium-239 and plutonium and get them across to us and deposit it. So then the question becomes, at some point, the actual risk of the old China syndrome, which is a hot corium blasting into cold groundwater, making a giant explosive release, might actually be preferable because uh, it would stop the fission and disperse the products. And we have to deal with the aftermath, but at least there's not an ongoing creation of some really, really nasty stuff. And this scenario is, uh, you know, by no means is this a lock this is what's occurring but it's indicative enough that I wager that somebody right now is red team blue teaming this and uh, they're performing an analysis to indicate at which point does it become viable to uh, explosively disperse uh, the quarium in these reactors you know, ideally something like that would occur under a monsoon scenario where you could wash out most of the uh, dispersed fallout into the ocean. 
Let's pray that I'm wrong. Good night.